please bow and pray with me. In the words that we take from Joshua, the verse 15 of chapter 5, bowed before you in worship, what does the Lord say to his servant? And in our case, Lord, what would you have for us, your servants, to hear this day? Send your Holy Spirit to quicken us that we might hear it and be transformed by it. For I ask your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Turn with me to Joshua 5. It's in your bulletin, or better yet, in your Bibles. We'll pick up in verse 13. It says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? The question before us, and Joshua, is this. How can we have victory over a great enemy? The answer is through superior strength and a decisive battle. A decisive battle is a central turning point in any war. These battles turn the tide of victory to one side or the other. And even though many battles are still left, for all intents and purposes, the war is over. And thinking about this, the battle that came to my mind was the Battle of Trenton. You all know about the Battle of Trenton? took place during the American Revolutionary War. As many of you know, it happened on December 26th, 1776 in Trenton, New Jersey. In order for it to take place, General George Washington had to cross the frozen Delaware River in the middle of the night. And it was funny, I was just reading through uh, David McCullough's 1776 this morning because I want to make sure I had my story straight because I have it and I, and I think that I have the facts and I was correct so I was glad. But you know when I get up here I need to be precise. But you remember the story. It was at the end of 1776. We had declared independence and General Howe had come in because you know Britain didn't care much for us you know declaring our independence and he said you know his whole armada and they were chasing us, and they, you know, they chased us all through the fall, and it came into December, and, and, and the Americans went past the Delaware towards Philadelphia, and surprisingly, even to this day, General Howe did what was standard practice at the time. He set up winter quarters. He said, I'm not going to pursue them anymore. Had he pursued them, I, I mean, all the historians pretty much agree we would not, be, we would not enjoy what we have today. We would still be uh, British subjects. But they stopped. This is why this was such a turning point. People were defecting from the American cause. People forget General Washington, he, he was trying to boost morale. But how can you boost morale when you're, you know, you're getting beat down and people were going back home? They were running out of supplies. And so there he was. What is he going to do? And he comes up with this surprise attack. And he goes across the Delaware in the middle of the night. And you can probably see the paintings where he's crossing it, right? In the early, in the early morning campaign, Washington led the main body of the Continental Army in a surprise attack against the Hessian mercenary force that was garrisoned there. And after a brief skirmish, they captured almost two-thirds of the entire force. And do you know how many American lives were lost? Zero. There were only five people wounded. It's astounding. The battle was a significant turning point in the war. And without it, we would not be the America we are today. Washington never would have won. And we probably wouldn't remember Washington like we do now. But instead, the victory boosted morale and it inspired people to re-enlist, which was desperately needed. Well, where could Joshua find this superior strength that could bring Israel such a decisive battle. Because remember, they're going into the promised land, and it was filled with what? Giants. They comparatively look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Where can we look for superior strength? Where can we find help to bring about the decisive battle that we are currently facing? 
Well, Josh just gives us the answer in Joshua 5. And as we turn there, we're going to find three things. The sign of the covenant, the blessings of the covenant, and the Lord of the covenant. So first, the sign of the covenant. Now, while the word covenant is not found anywhere in this chapter, it is everywhere implicit. The shocking discovery of this passage is that none of those who were born in the wilderness to God's covenantal people had received the sign of the covenant. Do you know what the sign of the covenant was? Circumcision. The sign of circumcision was given by God to Abraham some 440 years beforehand. Though other cultures practiced circumcision, it took on special meaning to Israel because this is what God told Abraham in Genesis 17. He said, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, he who is eight days old among you. Every male born in your house or any foreigner, so shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised shall be cut off from his people because he is broken covenant. Apparently, the rebellious people during the time of uh, the wilderness wandering, they could have cared less about this covenant. Thus, we find God's command to Joshua to reinstitute this covenant a second time. As verse 5 tells us, since all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. Circumcision was vitally important because it marked one's entrance into the people of God. I want you to put that on the top shelf. We're going to come back to it. Circumcision circumcision marks one's entrance into the people of God. Now, this whole concept of making covenants is foreign to us. We are more accustomed to, you know, sealing a deal by doing what today? What do we do? We, We sign a contract, don't we? In ancient times, they didn't do this. Instead, they acted out the curse that they would accept if they broke the covenant. So a man might pick up some sand and drop it and say, if I break this promise, I will become like this dust. Circumcision was a way of saying that if we break covenant, we will be cut off from others, from life, from God himself. Thus, it was shocking that God's people had ignored this covenant. But that brings two other questions to mind. Why does God make this request now, and how does it apply to us today? So first, why make this request now? And I think the answer is, it was a test. Would they obey God even at great risk to themselves? Because remember, they're going to Jericho. And who is in Jericho? Giants, right? So they have to fight. And God is telling them, to all the fighting men, I I want you to be circumcised. Do you know what that would mean for all the fighting men? (laughs) Would they be in fighting, you know, Uh, Would they be able to go out and fight? No, they would be putting themselves out of commission. God often permits us to be tested after some great victory. Remember, they had just crossed the Jordan River. And he does this in order to remind us that we need to trust in him and we need to find our dependence in him. In Genesis 12, right after Abraham followed God into the promised land, Abraham dutifully follows, leaves his family, leaves his father, leaves all of the wealth that he has, and he gets to the promised land, and what is he he greeted with? A famine. Well, 1 Kings 18 through 19. Right after Elijah triumphed over Baal, he was threatened with death. What about Jesus? Jesus was baptized. It was a, a glorious moment, remember? The Holy Spirit descended as a dove. And God audibly spoke, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then immediately we find that the spirit sends Jesus out into the wilderness to what? To be tempted by Satan. Great victories, you see, can lead to great pride. Thus God continues to test us so that we will learn to depend on him. And so I think that's very important. And especially when... uh, Whenever the Lord starts to move, especially in our lives, uh, and this is difficult, especially for new believers, right? Because the difficulty is that oftentimes some tests will come to us, and it's, it's not enjoyable. You know, it, it really is a shame, this, uh, 
prosperity gospel that gets preached. The idea that once you turn to Jesus, you know, your bank account will be blowing up and, you know, you'll become beautiful and everything will go well. But that's not what we find in Christianity. No, what we find is once you turn to Christ, that's when things actually get more difficult. Yeah, that, that doesn't really sell well in our culture, does it? But if it is the real God that we're following, what we learn in those tests is that we can trust in him. So speaking of baptism, that leads us to the second question. How does circumcision apply today? Well, is circumcision required? No. 1 Corinthians 7, Galatians 5, tell us no, we don't need him. Why? Because it was superseded by something. Do you know what replaced circumcision? Baptism. What is baptism? It marks one's entrance into the people of God. Where have we heard that before? That's circumcision. It marked one's entrance into the people of God. How? Colossians 2, 11 through 12 teaches us, In Jesus you were also circumcised, not by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Jesus, you see, was cut off from the land of the living. On the cross, he was cut off from his Father, so that we could be reconnected with him. So that we could be given life. But that raises a, another question. If baptism supersedes circumcision, what does the Lord's Supper supersede? Those are, the, those are the two sacraments that we have, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So baptism supersedes circumcision. What does the Lord's Supper supersede? The Passover. That's right. Which leads us to the second point which is the blessings of the covenant. And this is what we read in verse 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover. So you see the first part is all about what? Circumcision. And then the second part is all about what? Keeping the Passover. On the 14th day of the month, in the evening, on the plains of Jericho. You see, they could not enjoy the Passover feast, which was the blessings of the covenant, until they had first been circumcised, which is exactly what... Moses had instructed them in Exodus 12, which is exactly what we do with the Lord's Supper, don't we? Because every week I get up and I say, this is not Holy Trinity's table. This is the Lord's table. And everyone is able to come forward and receive? Is that what I say? Who can come forward and receive? Only those who have been baptized. Of course, I say it nicely. I I warmly invite all those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it makes sense, doesn't it? If you, you know, if you go over to somebody's house, you've got to enter into that house before you can go down and sit and and have supper with them, don't you? You've got to enter the house. This is a, a great discipleship for our children, right? Did circumcision save? Did it save the people? No. Does baptism save? No. no, it does not. That's why we baptize people of all ages. It doesn't save, but this is your entrance into the people of God. We want our children to know you are part of the people of God. And then when the time comes, we say, hey, you want to enjoy that, you know, the feast of the table? And I love it too. You know, you watch little children. They, they come up and, and uh, uh, well, I see it. You all don't see it, unless you're right next to them. But they want it. They'll reach out. They want that, uh, that bread and that wine. But this is the discipleship moment. We can teach our little ones, well, what does it mean? What does the bread and the wine mean? Do you see how this is so important? This is a part of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And we see it right here. And you see it. This is what's so amazing to me. You see it in the Old Testament. Circumcision and Passover. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. In this great feast, we remember that Jesus delivered us from Satan, sin, and death. This is foreshadowed in the Old Testament when Moses repeatedly commanded God's people to remember that they were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord had delivered them and made them his own people. This great truth was embodied in this annual Passover feast. They were never to forget that they were a redeemed people, set free. By the blood of the Lamb. And just as God had led his people out of Egypt during the Exodus, so we find another Exodus in Joshua 4 and 5, where they are led out of the wilderness. In the first Exodus, the Passover preceded the crossing of the Red Sea. In the second Exodus, the Passover immediately follows something. 
they pass through what? The Jordan. So you see, it's not an accident. It's, <laughs> it's just beautifully written. But know what happens in verse 12, immediately after they, they keep, the, fast, the, they keep uh, the Passover, and then they eat the produce from the land. What does 12, verse 12 tell us as happens? The manna dried up. See, we forget. Historically, for 40 years, they've been eating the manna in the wilderness. But they get through the Jordan. They keep the Passover. They eat the fruit of the promised land. And all of a sudden, the manna dries up. Why? It was because of their changed status. Just as they had renewed their identity as God's promised people through circumcision, so they now would be able to enjoy the fruit of the promised land. That brings up a question. What is the fruit of the promised land for us today? Does anyone know? I thought about this when I was writing it. It must be the fruit of the Spirit. Paul talks about this in Galatians 5. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Coconuts, you know, kiwi. What are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Now we haven't entered the ultimate promised land of God's new heavens and new earth yet, have we? But we get a foretaste of it through the Holy Spirit, don't we? The question is, are we enjoying that fruit today? Do we have peace? Do we have patience? Do we have faithfulness? Do we have self-control? Or are we still wandering in the wilderness of disbelief and self-reliance? Well, how can we enter into this land that you're talking about, preacher? I'm glad you asked, because that leads us to the third point, which is the Lord of the covenant. And this is what we read, and this is, you know, this, is, this is why the Bible is so amazing. Look at what Joshua encounters, right? He's going to look at this problem. He's got this issue. He's, he's a good general. He's doing reconnaissance, just like George Washington, right? This is what we read in verses 13 through 14. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And the man said, No. <laughs> but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Well, two questions come right to mind. <laughs> Number one, who is this man? And number two, why does he respond in such an enigmatic way? Actually, it's not enigmatic. I mean, why does he say no? You would expect him to say, yeah, let's go get him. But that's not what he says. He says, no, I am the commander of the Lord's army, and now I have come. Well, so first, who is this man? If you've been at Holy Trinity for at least a year, you will know who this man is, right? We've seen him many times. He, he shows up all throughout the Old Testament. You see him back in Genesis 18. You remember the pilgrim Abraham? He's sitting in, in, uh, in his tent. God has made this promise that he is going to make him uh, into a great nation, but his wife has an issue. She's barren, right? She can't have children. They're really old anyways. And these three strangers come, and one of them says to Abraham, in a year's time, Sarah will be with child. And Sarah hears the news, and what does she do? She laughs, which Isaac's name means laughter, right? So you see that. So you, you have this man appearing. But then you see him in Genesis 32. Remember that schemer Jacob? He is running away from Laban, right? Bad relationship there. He's messed that up. He's faced with Esau. And if you know the story of Genesis, Esau and Jacob really didn't see eye to eye. No, the last time he saw him, uh, I think the text says that he was breathing murderously. Esau wanted to murder Jacob. And he sent all of his family ahead of him, and, and I think he's getting ready to die, honestly, because he's heard that Esau is coming with 400 men, which is the biblical language for there is a war about to take place. And so he's sitting there and, you know, uh, obviously con contemplating what's to take place when all of a sudden a man should grab him by the shoulder and begin wrestling with him. And he wrestles with him. And Jacob, at some point, recognizes, you know what? Uh, this is God. He is the one who holds the blessing that I have longed for my entire life. But then this man comes again in Exodus 3. Remember, the murderer, Moses, had fled into the wilderness. And he had been there for 40 years. And he gets to the end of the wilderness. And lo and behold, he comes across this bush. 
and the angel of the Lord. This man is there, and he speaks to Moses through the bush, and he says, take off your sandals. Why? For the ground on which you stand is holy ground, which is astonishing because if you look at verse 15, these are the exact words that this man speaks to Joshua. So who is this man? It's the pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. What we learn from this man is that when God's people need saving, he will take the form of a human in order to rescue us. But second, if this is the case, why does he respond in the way that he does? It's because Joshua is asking the wrong question. Look again at what Joshua asks in verse 13. Are you for us or for our adversaries? In other words, which side are you going to take? Whose side are you on? It's the age-old question that the whole world is caught up on and why everyone is so keen on picking sides. But watch out if you pick the wrong side, right? This is a little bit humorous. And there's no Auburn fans in the crowd today, so I think it's permissible, although they're probably watching. I have a lot of Auburn friends. It's surprising for being an Alabama fan. But I'll never forget, we were, um, we were in um, Destin, Florida, and Auburn was playing. And they were playing Kansas State. I can't, rem- I can't believe I remember this. But, you know, I was cheering uh, for Auburn because all of my friends that were there were Auburn fans. But at some point, I remember, I'm an Alabama fan. <laughs> And I'm from the Midwest. I don't know if I want Auburn beating Kansas State. And, and so I kind of just like, you know, just like, oh, yeah, you know. And one of the guys next to me looks over and he says, whose side are you on? Because in the South, football is a pretty serious thing. But you see, that's the case. We do this not just with football, do we? We do this with denominations, you know. Which denomination are you a part of? We do this with politics, don't we? Whose side are you on? It's amazing to me. When he goes before Jesus, he says, whose side are you on? He says, you know, which side are you on? No, I'm not on either side. I am the commander of the Lord, and I have now come. So here is Joshua. He's on this reconnaissance mission to scope out the enemy in Jericho. And right before he gets there, he stumbles across this warrior with his drawn sword. And let me just ask you, if someone has their sword drawn, what, what are they trying to communicate to you? I'm, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to attack. Thus, Joshua asks a very reasonable question. Are you for us or against us? And it, look again how the warrior responds. No, but I am the commander of the Lord, and I have now come. He refuses to accept the way Joshua has framed the question. Why? Because Joshua needs to understand that there is a story larger than his that is currently unfolding. And it's God's story. We were just praying this morning. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But against whom? Who? Does anyone know? Satan, the devil, demons. Yeah, it exists. But what's he The greatest trick the devil ever pulled off was to convince the world that he doesn't exist. And if you believe the media, you know who your enemy is. If we could just get rid of this political side, then all of our, you know, issues would be, you know, they'd be hunky-dory. But is that true? Because who is our battle with? It's with Satan. It's interesting, too, because did anyone catch the passage that we read, the gospel passage? Do you know what it was about? I know, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions today. It's the good. Now, you had several people. You had the priest come by. And the priest was a good guy, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, God's people, priests were pretty important people. He helped the guy who had fallen amongst the robbers, right? He didn't help? Well, that's surprising. Well, who, who, who came next? The Levite. Well, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, right? Surely he'll help, right? Who was it that helped? Samaritans. Do you know what the Jews refer to the Samaritans as? Dogs. These are, they're not on the right side. And yet, who is the one that showed mercy? The dog. So, going back to this ultimate Joshua that Joshua comes across, and he asks, whose side are you on? Are you on my side? 
And what does he say? No. What we need to learn, if we are really following Jesus Christ, we are going to stand out. Because what matters is not that God is on our side. What Joshua is learning is, are we on God's side? Does God have a heart for all of humanity? Yeah! Why? Because each and every person in this country and in this world was made in the image of God. And so if we really believe that, we can get upset if people don't believe what we believe politically. But does that mean we dehumanize them? Does it mean that we attack them? No, we need to lead them to somebody. Who is that? Jesus! Because Jesus is the ultimate warrior. He's going into into Jericho. Joshua is. And the ultimate Joshua shows up. And he asks, and, and he presents Joshua with this question Are you on my side? That's the question we're faced with. And if we really follow this ultimate Joshua, we will stand out. But I tell you the truth we will be victorious. Not because of us, but because Jesus is fighting on our side. Each of us needs to understand this truth very clearly. Our lives are not our own, but are a part of God's larger story. And we are going to have to give an account for the part we play someday. Furthermore, Joshua was reminded that he, though a great commander, was second in command. Every father, mother, pastor, politician needs to learn this truth. Because the moment we forget that, we are second in command to the Lord Jesus Christ, is the moment we start heading towards failure and defeat. The Lord came to Joshua that day not just to help, but to lead. As Jesus would later say in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Yes, Joshua was skilled and experienced, and he was groomed for leadership by Moses. Yet none of that mattered. No, what Joshua needed was the presence of the Lord and for the Lord to fight for him. What was Joshua's response to this warrior in verse 15? So we know all this. How did, the, how did Joshua respond? The only thing to do when you come across God, you fall on your face and you worship him. And look at this. He says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And that's where the great uh, parallel words come. Take off your sandals, for the ground on which you walk is holy ground. When Joshua met the Lord, he discovered that the war was already over, for the Lord had come to fight The decisive battle occurred when Joshua bent the knee and submitted to God. And this is not in the sermon, but any battle that you have right now, what we need to do is we need to bend our knee and say, Lord, not necessarily change my circumstances, but change me. Change me in these circumstances. God had already given Jericho to Israel. That's what we're going to see next week in Joshua 6, verse 2. All the Israelites had to do was step out in faith and claim the victory that the Lord had given them. Now, I hasten to say, I like Joshua because he's a strategist. He doesn't shoot from the hip. No, he's patient, he's discerning, and he is willing to take the initiative. Interestingly enough, Again, none of these things matter. Joshua went to look at his problem, and he found himself staring God right in the face. And what he learned from this encounter was that he first needed to grapple with God's will and God's word before he could grapple with the problem in front of him. In so doing, he learned that God had already given him the victory. And when we know that we have already won... Well, then that changes everything, doesn't it? Has anyone ever watched, uh, you know, uh, a game for your favorite team that's been recorded? But before you could watch it, someone told you what happened? You found out your team won? Does it change the excitement of you watching the game? Not for me. Because the only game I like Alabama playing is a complete blowout, right? If they screw up at all, it's like, oh, we're going to lose. This is over. But when you know your team's won, someone's told you that, and you you can watch the game, and you can relax. Oh, you know, Jalen Hurts threw an interception. Oh, you know, uh, your running back fumbles the ball. You know, oh, that's bad, but what do you know is going to happen? Well, I can't wait to see how this works out, because they're going to overcome this uh, adversity, aren't they? 
so you can watch it and not be freaking out? Do we realize that Jesus has already won the ultimate victory for us? The decisive battle took place on the cross where Jesus defeated our greatest enemies, Satan, sin, and death itself, which are the three things that Satan wants to uh, blind us to. He wants us to think that our enemies are flesh. And we need to see that our enemy are these three, Satan, sin, and death itself. At the time Jesus was crucified, it looked like a terrible loss to his disciples. But in reality, it was an astonishing victory. Think of how the founding fathers felt after the Revolutionary War. Do you think they were excited that they defeated with a bunch of farmers the, the British, you know, empire? Yeah. What about World War II after we defeated Hitler? Were people excited? You can probably see the, that iconic picture of that sailor kissing that nurse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it was jubilation. To the extent that we see that the decisive battle has been won by Christ will be the extent to which we will be able to handle the current battle that we are facing. Because remember, that, that, that illustration of watching that game, if they fumble it, if you face adversity, do you have to worry? No, because the decisive battle has been won. To the degree that we understand that we are part of God's larger story will be the degree to which we become useful weapons and instruments in the hands of the Lord. Don't you want to push back against the darkness in this world? Don't you want Christ's truth to, to permeate our land? Don't you want to experience joy? Don't you want to experience peace? Then believe the gospel and you'll start enjoying it today. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your word, for it is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And I pray that you would penetrate our hearts this day, that the seeds of your gospel would find fertile ground, and that you would bear fruits 20-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. For we ask this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us